Thank you everyone for coming today. Really appreciate the full house. Uh, glad to see some excitement in this brand new service. My name is Jamie Kinney. Uh, along with Dougal Ballantyne, we're the two product managers for a new service we announced today called AWS Batch. Uh, I want to use our time today to walk through a, a few different topics, starting with a brief history and some background on batch computing, um, sharing a little bit of, of the, the concepts of the AWS Batch service, and then getting into use cases and even take it for a spin with the demo. Um, starting though with, with a little bit of background, so when we were, we were building this service, we thought, okay, what, what are some of the core components of batch computing? A lot of customers are, are running batch workloads on AWS, but what are the, the common denominators to these workloads? And it, it really comes down to really two key areas. The first is that batch computing workloads um, can run asynchronously. It, it's not important that these jobs run immediately as the API is submitted. It's okay if it takes a little bit of time, perhaps, for the, for the first instance to launch, if you're submitting your first small job to a queue. Uh, and secondly, because these jobs are, are running asynchronously, um, especially when these jobs are part of a, a larger pipeline or, or workflow, it's important to keep track of the, the specific order in which these jobs run. So the ability to specify dependencies between jobs is a, a core element of batch computing. And then as we were, we were thinking about what the service might look like, uh, we, we started doing a bit of research. And so we, we went back a ways because batch computing, as you know, is, is not a new concept. It's been around for decades. Um, what we see here is, is Margaret Hamilton. She was the developer for the Apollo program. This is the, the stack of code that, that she helped write for the Apollo missions. And this is actually the, the IBM uh, supercomputer that was used to, uh, to uh, generate the, the applications that were eventually hard soldered onto the onboard computer on the, on the Apollo, uh, on the Apollo uh, command capsule. So uh, a few of you got uh, punch cards. I'll, I'll have more, and you'll, you'll see these at the, at the compute booth tomorrow, too. I'll, I'll bring another stack by. Uh, but what several of you hold in your hand is actually the first batch computing API. And we thought we could maybe do a little bit better uh, than, than, than punch cards. So I, I apologize. We don't have a, a, a punch card import service. We don't have a punch card reader project posted to AWS Labs yet. If there's customer demand, we're listening. Uh, we'll try to get there. Uh, maybe we'll have a giant semi-truck that can pull up and, and get your, your punch cards because the information density is a little bit low. Um, but you know, some of the other uh, pieces of inspiration we took, uh, we, we looked at the, the cost of supercomputing and how that's changed over time. Uh, so this is you know, circa, circa mid-70s, a, a, a crazy supercomputer. This was the first commercially available supercomputer. Could do 167 million transactions per second. Uh, and uh, this computer cost, you know, in, in $76, in 1976 dollars, you know, about, about $9 million, uh, of which a million of that was uh, attributed to the, to the storage cost. Now, AWS you know, has been around for a little while now. We haven't been around for many decades, but we've been around for about a decade. And uh, one of the, the, the very first public case studies uh, that, that I recall from my, my early days at AWS uh, was the New York Times Times Machine project. And this was a, a really groundbreaking project for, for me because I, it helped me see the, the true potential of, of elastic compute and the ability to very cost-effectively run workloads that have a little bit of flexibility as to when they run it and how they execute. So with the, the New York Times Time Machine project, uh, they, they spun up an, an elastic cluster of EC2 instances uh, using infrastructure or, or code that they, they developed themselves to uh, manage the queuing of jobs, manage the provisioning of resources, um, and, and even creating a, an elastically scaled EMR cluster. Uh, and they, with this, they were able to process 11 million articles of, of TIFFs that they uh, performed OCR on so they could create a, a searchable index of, of all the, the past uh, 130 years of, of archived New York Times uh, issues. And at the time in 2007, uh, before we've had uh, you know, many, many, many price cuts, uh, this workload cost $890. That, that's quite a bit less expensive than the almost $9 million for the, for the Cray supercomputer. And I think if, if we were to run the same workload today, we could probably do the same for, for just a, a few dollars. Uh, so uh, economics are, are definitely improving. But uh, running uh, and on a, a batch computing workload requires a, a bit of work. And I want to talk a little bit about what that looks like on-premise and what that looks like on AWS. So starting with on-premise, uh, not surprising that if you're going to run batch computing workloads, you first need to provision a lot of storage and, and a lot of servers. And historically, the approach that, that folks have taken is to provision a lot of identical servers. And these servers are, are typically sized either for the greatest common denominator of workloads, which could be a little bit expensive if you're trying to uh, accommodate any, any type of workload that might run on these servers, or they're, they're, they're designed to run the majority of workloads. And so it's accepted that some workloads might not be the best fit, but in general, you're going to serve your, your users fairly well. And then you have network-attached storage that often has a, a shared set of installed programs that are accessible to, to any computer. 
computer. In addition to that, of course, you need to manage backups, uh, security, networking infrastructure. You need to have people that are, that are available to respond and help out your users and, and operate the system. And you typically have to uh, use some commercial software, which requires uh, oftentimes expensive contracts, and, and these, these take some time to be negotiated you know, on an annual or, or every couple of year basis. So comparing this with, oh, pardon me. Uh, so let's look, let's look at, at, at uh, how this, this model might work and, and maybe some of the challenges, the challenges that exist around this. So uh, what you see in this presentation are, are shapes that represent different types of workloads. So the, the blue squares uh, represent CPU intensive workloads, uh, the orange circles represent memory intensive workloads, and the, the yellow triangles represent uh, disk or, or network I.O. intensive workloads. And the funnel is the queue that you're submitting your jobs to in your, in your on-prem cluster. And this works well if your jobs are, are sized appropriately for the, the types of machines that you have at your disposal. And you can quickly run through all these jobs um, until you run out of capacity. And then jobs either you know, wait in the queue or they, or they fail because they're, they're unable to run in the, the time that you'd like to complete them. That's a, a pretty good case, actually, for, for on-prem traditionally managed batch systems. Now, what, what actually happens, though, is that you have a diversity of workloads, not only in the, the types of, of requirements around CPU and memory and, and uh, disk and network I.O., uh, but you have uh, variations in the, in the magnitude of those requirements, too. And so the, the jobs that are sized uh, relative to the, to the resources you have, they're, they're able to run. Um, but when you have smaller jobs, they don't uh, necessarily take up all the space in those resources. So if you have you know, 64 vCPUs on your, on your machine, you might only be using 48 of them. And so you've got some unused capacity there. Uh, but if you have larger machines, um, they're not able to run, or larger workloads, they're not able to run. And, um, and there, you, therefore, you, you get uh, inefficient utilization of the resources that you've provisioned, and you have unhappy users because these jobs aren't uh, necessarily able to run or run as quickly as, as they'd like. So compare this. Then, uh, now going a step further, uh, we, we heard in, the, in Andy's keynote talk um, that there's a, a growing trend of, of adoption of various types of, of accelerators. You know, quick show of hands, how many folks in the room are, are, are using GPUs today for GPU, GPU workloads or GPU accelerated workloads? Okay. Um, and how many folks are, are considering heading down this path in, in the near term? Okay. Uh, anybody excited by the, the FPGA launch the other day? Yeah, FPGAs, uh, so if, if GPUs give us you know, a, a couple of orders of magnitude acceleration for jobs that are traditionally run on, on CPUs, FPGAs have potential to give us yet another order or even two orders of magnitude of acceleration, um, it, both in performance and also the, uh, the power consumption. And so there's a lot of efficiency gains that come here. Of course, there's going to be some work to uh, enable our applications to take advantage of these. But if you're to try to run these workloads on a cluster that you built maybe a couple of years ago uh, on premise, you're, you're going to have a hard time fitting these uh, diverse set of workloads effectively on, on the cluster. And so if you're going to run the same workload, maybe the cloud has some advantages. And so with all, all these new instance types that, that we've launched, of course, you're able to provision resources as your jobs are submitted. You're able to provision appropriately sized resources as those jobs are submitted. Great, right? However, there's some challenges to this approach. In order to build the system that, that we just showed you, where you have uh, FPGA uh, jobs running on our F1 instances, you have GPU accelerated workloads running on our P2 instances, you have to uh, build a lot of undifferentiated heavy lifting yourselves. You have to um, figure out how you're going to provision your EC2 resources. You have to manage auto scaling. You have to set up a queuing system, potentially using SQS and, and storing some metadata in DynamoDB. You want to monitor the system, so you're probably going to have some CloudWatch scheduled events uh, that are, are triggering Lambda functions that might create custom uh, CloudWatch metrics. Uh, and, and on and on. Now, we have reference architectures that help guide you through that process. And historically, this is the approach that many people have taken, and cl including many teams within AWS. Uh, if you look at the Elastic Transcoder, there's a batch system underneath that. If you look at our machine learning services, we had to build a batch system for both training of the models and batch execution of those models. Within Amazon, we've easily built batch systems ourselves many, many tens of times, maybe even, even 100 times, depending on, uh, on how, you, uh, how you measure those systems. Long and short of it, a lot of people have, have reinvented very, very similar wheels. And so we think we have a better approach. We, we wanted to build a, a self-driving car company instead of teaching people how to build wills. So uh, today we'd like to introduce the AWS Batch service. And the, the core goals of our service were to help you, our, our, our helpful users, uh, accomplish a few things. First, we wanted to provide a fully managed service. We want to reduce the amount of undifferentiated heavy lifting that you have. We want you to be able to focus on your jobs. Tell us about the requirements for those jobs. Tell us the applications you'd like to run. And we'll go figure out how to execute them so that you don't have to worry about infrastructure. You can, you can focus on supporting your customers. Second, uh, we 
while we, we see a lot of the value that comes from uh, AWS capabilities such as, as auto scaling uh, and identity and access management and, uh, and the cost savings that come from uh, capabilities such as EC2 Spot, we thought that batch that was built on the cloud for the cloud uh, could actually benefit in a number of other ways too. And so we wanted to make the service very easily integrated with as many other AWS services as possible. Uh, I'm sure if you've attended some of the keynotes for the past few days, you've heard about Lex, you've heard about Poly, you've heard about the recognition service. Uh, we have an increasing range of services that um, benefit tremendously from operating in, in a batch mode. So if you have, uh, you have perhaps thousands of, of documents that you'd like to convert into a, an MP3 using Poly, or if you have a, a corpus of images in an S3 bucket that you'd like to uh, perform image recognition on, um, Batch is a fantastic way to, to tackle those types of problems. And so we make it very simple for you to integrate these services into the AWS Batch jobs that you run with identity and access management, uh, roles assigned per each of your tasks or each of your jobs. And then, of course, we want to give you access to EC2 Spot, but without uh, some of the challenges or complexity that some of our users have reported uh, with, with EC2 Spot and Spot Block and, and, or, and, uh, and scheduled reserved instances. And so giving you the ability to tell us what types of resources you want and if, if using Spot, what type of bid you'd like to make, uh, we, we want to greatly simplify the provisioning of those resources. So the, with AWS Batch, we now offer fully managed batch computing primitives. We allow you to run your applications that are either explicitly or implicitly containerized. So giving us a, a, a Docker command, a Docker container image, and, and the parameters with which you'd like us to run that, that Docker image, um, or giving us a, a zip that you'd like us to run on top of a default Amazon Linux machine image. And then we'll take care of uh, Amazon Linux container image, and then we'll take care of the rest for you. So some of the concepts involved with this service include uh, very familiar terms to anybody who's worked with batch systems in the past. Jobs, job definitions, queues, compute environments, and of course the scheduler. So stepping through each of these in a little bit more detail, uh, jobs uh, that, that you specify are submitted to an AWS batch job queue. Within your account, you can have multiple job queues and each of these job queues uh, can have a, a relative priority to each other. Your jobs can reside in these job queues until they're ready to run, either because those jobs have a, an external dependency on another job, or because we're waiting for uh, resources to be launched for those jobs to run upon. If you want to submit a job, we have an AWS batch uh, uh, create job queue command that will allow you to start submitting your jobs. The job queues that you create are mapped to a compute environment, or potentially multiple compute environments. And a compute environment uh, can be either uh, one of two types. It could be a managed compute environment in which you're giving us some guardrails. You're telling us the min, max, and desired number of vCPUs in aggregate. You're telling us which instance types you would like us to launch on your behalf, either being very prescriptive and saying only launch uh, C5, 8XLs, or telling us optimal, let, let AWS Batch figure it out for me. And then uh, if you want to use Spot, you tell us what percentage of on-demand pricing you would like us to bid on your behalf. It tells us about the VPC subnets you can launch in, tags to apply, and a few other features. And then we will start to launch compute resources in response to the arrival of jobs and the resource requirements of each of those jobs. So if you have a lot of memory intensive jobs, we'll start launching instances that have appropriate amounts of, of memory free workloads. If you have uh, CPU intensive workloads that don't need as much memory, we can, we can run those on uh, compute resources that are more appropriately sized for those jobs. And because we're running your jobs uh, within Docker containers, uh, we have the ability to run multiple jobs concurrently on the same host, and so we get more uh, efficiency gains in the execution of those, those jobs on top of your EC2 instances. The instances that we launch are launching within your AWS account. So you'll see these popping up in the EC2 console, and um, you have the ability to, uh, to interact with them if you like. If you want to specify uh, a key pair and uh, assign these instances to a security group that gives you SSH access, you can do that. Uh, a lot of the customers that we've spoken to already during our, our beta have said that they, they might actually prefer not to connect to these instances and just focus on executing their jobs. Now, this works, we think, for the, the majority of, of the hopeful users of, of the service. Now, but there, there are some categories of users who have uh, resource requirements that go beyond what we're going to be providing by default at launch with our, our minimum viable product, which is available today. And so for those users, we're going to be also offering unmanaged compute environments. So you can think of these as being very similar to an ECS cluster, uh, for those of you who have used the EC2 container service. An ECS cluster, as you know, is a, a logical representation of a, of a collection of compute resources. So if you create an unmanaged compute environment, we will then create an ECS cluster for you. You can launch your instances of an AMI that has the ECS agent installed running a, a compatible version of, of Linux. 
And uh, those instances, once they're launched and registered with the ECS cluster we've created for you, are accessible, and we'll start scheduling jobs to those to those compute resources. With unmanaged uh, uh, with unmanaged compute environments, you have the ability to attach terabytes of, of EBS storage to each of your compute resources. You can attach EFS file systems, uh, Lustre, OrangeFS, the you know, file system of, of your choice to these instances and uh, allows you to uh, also take advantage of, of dedicated instances or, or a number of other EC2 features. So effectively giving you custom, um, custom EC2 instances on which we can uh, schedule your jobs. So before you schedule a job, though, uh, first thing you need to do is actually register a job definition. You tell us a little bit about, a, effectively, this is a template for, for the, the job or the jobs that you would like to run. A job definition tells us uh, the application you'd like to run, the role that you'd like to associate with the job when it executes, uh, the, the mount points. Um, so if you have a, a, a mount point that's maybe slash mount slash EFS dash one, two, three, four, five on the host, how you'd like to map that within the container instance when we actually execute the job, uh, as well as uh, environmental variables and, and other properties of the container. With these job definitions, some of our users may choose to create a job definition per job that they execute. Other users may choose to override one or, or multiple parameters um, and simply create a few job definitions that they use as, as templates for common classes of, of jobs that they submit. Now, when you're actually ready to submit your job to your job queue that's mapped to one or multiple compute environments using that job definition, um, you'll do so using the, the command that you see here. Um, and as we mentioned, your jobs will uh, can either reference a container image, or if you're submitting a job through the console, you'll be able to upload a zip containing your application. Uh, we'll also give you uh, the ability, uh, similar to what we do with the ECS Lambda console, the ability to paste in some code and, and kind of uh, give us a, a Python script or, or some, um, uh, some JavaScript code that you would like us to run on your behalf. We'll zip it up for you, upload it to your S3 bucket, and then uh, reference that when we, when we run an Amazon Linux container instance to execute the, the code within that zip file. Now, uh, You've noticed that we've, we've launched, if you attended the keynote this morning, that we're, we're launching in preview mode. That's because there's a couple of features that we want to be able to add to AWS Batch before we give everybody access to it. And one of those features is the ability to run arrays of jobs. So we've talked a little bit about simple jobs. These are jobs that can run on a single host uh, using one or, or as many vCPUs as you get on a machine, as much memory as is available on a machine. Uh, but for many users, they want to simplify the submission of many, many, many jobs. And so in that case, uh, we have, uh, we're working on a feature that you'll soon see with the service called array jobs, where you can give us the command that you'd like to run and say, run a thousand copies of this. And here's the array of, of parameters for all of those jobs that we're running. And then each job can do effectively the same thing, but each working on their part of the, of the bigger puzzle. Uh, a great approach for parametric sweeps and Monte Carlo simulations. Uh, another type of job execution that we're going to be adding to uh, that I think was mentioned by Werner is the ability to execute jobs as Lambda functions. And we'll talk about why you might want to use AWS Batch to execute Lambda functions in just a bit. So um, as we were designing this service, and this is probably back in the March-April time frame, uh, Dougal and I were, were thinking a bit about uh, the types of workloads that we expected to see. And, and life sciences is a, a, a really core workload that we wanted to focus upon and uh, did some research and we found a common pipeline for, for next generation sequencing where you get an unassembled, effectively collection of puzzle pieces that you first need to assemble. Uh, you need to then you know, make sure that you've assembled it in, in the correct order. And then you can start doing some analysis with that individual genome and then against a, a larger corpus of genomes. And this involves a lot of steps. And the, the, the DAG that you see in front of you is, is actually a, a, a very common reference uh, pipeline for, for genomics workloads. And we thought, well, maybe we should have a submit workflow API for the service. But then as we talked to a few more customers, we realized that uh, different customers have different approaches and, and tools and languages that they'd like to use for workflows. So we, we got rid of the submit workflow API and instead said, what if we add job dependencies to the submit job API? And so with the AWS batch submit job command or, or, or API action, you can reference other jobs that you only want to start once the first job has succeeded. And so this allows you to use Flow or DAG-based workflow engines of your choice. You can use AWS Step Functions. You can use Pegasus. You can use um, Luigi. You could use the workflow engine of your choice and simply have the workflow engine either submit jobs one, wait for that to complete, then submit job two, then three, then four, or submit jobs one, two, three, four, specifying the dependencies that exist, such that four depends on three, three on two, two on one, and then AWS Batch will ensure that those jobs run in the right order. Once their dependencies have, met, have been met, we'll run the jobs in the order that they've arrived. So the, the system or the component of AWS Batch 
that runs with, behind the scenes that makes sure that those jobs run in the right order on appropriately sized resources and is it's responsible for ensuring that we, we scale up and down as appropriate with the, the right heterogeneous mix of compute resources is the scheduler. And so the scheduler, um, the one that we'll, we'll launch with, uh, ensures that we run jobs in, in approximately the same order in which they're submitted once all of their, their dependencies have been met. Over time, uh, we, we have uh, the, the goal to submit a, actually a number of, of scheduling algorithms. Some customers have expressed a, a desire for uh, fair share scheduling, deadline scheduling is a common requirement that we hear, and we have a few other ideas that we um, will probably talk about uh, a little bit more in 2017. Uh, before we get into uh, work, uh, into uh, use cases or, or some reference architectures, just wanted to quickly show the, the types of APIs that will support for the service. Uh, documentation for the service should be appearing uh, relatively soon. Um, and if anybody signs up for the preview, hopefully quite a few. Show of hands, who signed up for the preview already? Okay, hopefully more of you will sign up soon. Um, the preview, uh, you'll be getting a link to the documentation uh, as soon as we whitelist your account, as well as access to the console uh, and the ability to start using the service. Okay, uh, another important feature of this service, um, it's free. Uh, we, we don't charge for the service. We only charge for the underlying compute resources that you use, so the EC2 instances or database calls or, or storage that you use for your jobs. Uh, so hopefully this will help uh, further reduce the cost of running batch, uh, batch computing workloads on, on AWS. Uh, and then uh, just a little bit more detail. The, the preview release uh, is currently in the US East region. Uh, as we move to, to GA, hopefully very quickly, uh, we're going to be um, going GA in Virginia and then expanding to other regions as, as quickly as we possibly can, uh, while we also add support for array jobs and Lambda jobs. Uh, quickly, going back just for a moment, um, one, one question that may come up is, why would you want to use uh, Lambda functions with AWS Batch? Well, the first reason is you might want to use uh, the array job primitive to submit many, many copies of, of a Lambda job. Um, we also support job retries. So if you have a Lambda function that uh, may uh, be interacting with something else that, that could time out, uh, we'll ensure that we retry that Lambda function um, until it's successful up to the, the number of retries that you've specified. Uh, and then you could also use Lambda functions as part of a pipeline that may uh, go back and forth between Lambda execution and containerized uh, job execution. Okay, and then one other point uh, I'd like to talk about just briefly, this has actually been talked about a little bit today, uh, is that there's a lot of different categories of, of batch workloads. When, when some people think of batch, they, they think of uh, ETL and, and uh, big data workloads where uh, you, you might want to actually look at uh, using a service like Elastic MapReduce and its ability to interact with a, a data lake in S3, uh, talk to, uh, natively to, to DynamoDB and Redshift. Um, for some customers, they might also choose to use Batch to, to run some of these workloads. Uh, again, we, we offer many tools and services so you can find the, the right fit for, for your organization. Uh, another common category of batch workloads is, is cron execution. We have lots of little jobs that are happening at, at recurring times. We're a great platform to execute those jobs, but we're probably not the, gonna have the best console experience to manage the scheduling of those jobs, uh, scheduling in terms of calendar and, and clock time. And so you may wanna work with, uh, uh, with, with cron or with a, a third party solution, open source or commercial, to trigger the execution or submission of, of AWS batch jobs for those workloads. But that does leave a, a massive amount of, 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 of high scale, uh, uh, embarrassingly parallel and, and, and uh, collections of, of large single node computations that are really a great fit for AWS Batch. Okay, uh, before we get to the demo, I just wanted to walk very quickly through a, a few uh, reference implementations that we had in mind as we were designing the service. So the first one is, is DNA sequencing. So if you have a, a, a DNA sequencer, um, oftentimes they're, they're now able to write directly to S3 as, as samples are being processed. You get your, your unaligned uh, genome files in uh, in a format that then uh, is, is ready to be processed by AWS Batch. So the way that you trigger the submission of these, of these batch jobs is to have a, a, an S3 event trigger a Lambda function that might do an initial scan of those files, extract some metadata, and then use that to submit the, the pipeline of, of jobs to AWS Batch with job dependencies specified at, at submission time. We'll then run through that, that pipeline of jobs, uh, issuing retries as appropriate, and then the results can be written back to your, uh, to your S3 bucket or to a different S3 bucket if you like, and then um, you can use other tools to, uh, such as EMR, for, to, for example, to do population level uh, genomic analysis against those workloads. Uh, what we see here is an example architecture that we've, uh, we've already developed and tested. Uh, Aaron Friedman, one of the uh, life sciences uh, solutions architects in our team, uh, worked with Angel Pizarro and I to, to develop this architecture. What you see here is uh, what I just described, but using unmanaged compute environments. Uh, each of the, of the instances in the uh, ECS cluster that we create as part of an unmanaged compute environment has access to multiple terabytes of, of EBS storage. 
There's an auto-scaling group that's actually being used to, to scale up and down the number of nodes in the cluster. And the way that we, uh, we, we direct auto-scaling to work is we have a, a CloudWatch scheduled event that's firing a Lambda function that queries the runnable jobs in the job queue. And as the number of runnable jobs increases, that indicates that we need more work to be done. We need more resources to process those jobs. And so uh, that Lambda function creates a CloudWatch metric that causes us to scale up the auto-scaling group. As the jobs uh, in a runnable state start to decline, we start to scale down the resources uh, using that same CloudWatch metric. The results are then written back to an S3 bucket. Of course, there's no credentials built into the jobs themselves because the jobs have an associated identity and access management role. So you can very safely and securely um, have AWS Batch uh, interact with other AWS services, such as DynamoDB or S3. Uh, computational chemistry, uh, I won't go into as much detail so that we have a little bit more time for Q&A and, and demos. Uh, another great fit, uh, media transcoding and encoding is, is something that's uh, very commonly used. Uh, you'll have all these slides available um, as we, we publish our, our session. So, um, maybe I'll, I'll move on just for a bit. Um, what I'd like to do is, is get to the demo. Uh, before we go to the uh, interactive service, wanted to show something that we, we hope to include in, in Werner's keynote today, but we didn't quite make it with all of the, the great announcements we had today. And so this is a um, kind of an animation we put together for AWS Batch. So what we see here is a, a collection of jobs uh, each of these jobs has three stages in the pipeline, and each of the, of the, the colors and shapes has different resource requirements, memory, CPU, I.O., et cetera. And so these jobs are submitted to a, a job queue, Q1, which is mapped to an on-demand compute environment that has a, a, a min of zero and a max of, of, of 20 instances. It would actually be expressed in vCPUs. And as we submit jobs to the queue and start processing them, you'll see that we only process the red jobs because they're the first job in, in the pipeline. And we don't want to start processing the blue and green jobs because their dependencies have not yet been met. And we're running the red jobs on a, on a compute-optimized instance, the C4, maybe a C5 now. Um, as those complete, we're able to run the next step in the pipeline, and so we start spinning up uh, memory-optimized instances to run memory-intensive workloads, both the, the blue and the green workloads. Great. Now, we also have a second queue of work that we, we want to run. It's, it's lower priority work, and it's, it's work that can take advantage of a, a broader range of, of instance types. And so we create a second queue and a second compute environment that's a, a spot compute environment, and it's set to only launch instances when the spot price dips below a certain percentage of on-demand pricing. And so we start submitting lots and lots of work to this queue, but because the spot price is still a little bit higher than we'd like to pay, uh, no work is happening. But once the spot price dips uh, below the, the threshold that we've specified, AWS Batch automatically starts launching instances for you, and work from that second queue starts getting processed. Now, I still have a lot of work in my first queue, so what I can do is also map that second compute environment, my spot compute environment, to that first queue, so that when the spot price is, again, below that certain threshold, I'm able to take advantage of a much larger pool of compute resources, so that I'm preferentially doing the work from my, my first queue, the higher priority queue, and only once all of that work has been drained, and it'll take just a second for, the, for that work to drain, since we have so many compute resources, um, then I'll start processing work from my, my second queue. Um, and then, as you'll see here, uh, and skipping along, so uh, Google has a time, some chance to talk. Um, as the, the jobs um, finish, and we, we no longer require the CPU optimized and eventually the memory optimized instances, we start turning off instances for you. Okay, why don't we actually take a look at the real service now? So I'll, I'll hand off to, to Google now. Thank you, Jamie. You're welcome. I'll plug it in. Okay. Thanks, man. Yep. Um, that's a cool demo. Yeah. It's easier than doing live demos. Uh, so <laughs> so uh, you can tell he's the outbound product manager. Um, so my name is Dougal Ballantyne. Uh, I'm one of the other product managers on AWS Batch. Uh, I've been with Amazon uh, a little over four years now. And uh, I've spent most of my time actually talking and, and working with customers on batch computing, uh, specifically in the high performance computing space. And uh, we've, we've been working on this. Uh, I, I actually. Uh, a lot of fun doing this. We, we wanted to do this for quite a long time, and what we hope we've done now and what we're introducing today is the, the foundation for a lot more batch computing primitives that we can build on top of this, and uh, hopefully it's uh, pretty exciting for the customers to see what they can do with it. So I, uh, I'm the brave, crazy guy who thought we'd do a live demo, so password works. Screen work? Yep. Okay, okay. Uh, let's do 
that as well. Can everyone see that okay? Yeah? Awesome. <laughs> awesome. That's not our software, is it? That, that is not our software. That's someone else's software, actually. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, let's give it a shot. See if that works. Cool, you restored an empty one. Okay. Cool. Uh, did everyone notice the new console home launch last week? Yeah, I, I still can't find anything. <laughs> uh, righty. So uh, what I wanted to do was um, have a little bit of a play with the service. Uh, so we're, we're up in preview right now. What that means is that we're uh, ready to start taking customers, but we've got a few more things we want to get done before we uh, announce the service as GA and make it uh, available to everyone and start expanding around the globe. Um, what Jamie uh, sort of introduced to you was some of the concepts, some of the primitives, the notions of job queues and compute environments and job definitions. Um, uh, as with all good demos, uh, I went, of course, and sort of pre-typed half of the stuff because you don't want to watch me making typos across the screen. That's not really a cool demo. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk through some of the things that are usually done either with the console. I didn't set the console up for today, but uh, stuff that would normally be done through the console, you can just click through the wizard and take care of it. Uh, or like everything in AWS, we have a CLI, so you can go in and, and use the CLI. I'll also take a little moment to explain some of the things that, that we're doing in here. Oh, that's already off and running. Um, so what we're doing here is creating a compute environment. Now you can think of a compute environment as a collection of resources that are required for the jobs to run. Um, when we think about a compute environment internally as the service team, we think of it as a set of constraints and guidance the customer has given us. So these are, these are the, the things you want us to do. It's like a contract. So you've said to us, I want you to use certain instance types. I only want them in this AZ. If we're using spot, this is the price I want you to bid. And the rest of it I want you to take care of. So that, that's the ask. And so when you make the create compute environment call, you're providing that data to us. And I'll, I'll really quickly take a look at what we provided here. So uh, the, these things are stuff Jamie mentioned. So we're doing managed and some state. Uh, we're doing an EC2 one. Some min and some max CPUs that need to be created. Instance types. So in this example, we set instance types to optimal. Now, Optimal isn't an instance we launched on, on Wednesday. Andy didn't launch Optimal. There's so many of them. Uh, so what Optimal actually is, is a collection of instance types. And it's in our documentation. And right now, it refers to the C4, M4, and R4 family. And we will pick out of those instance types the ones that make the most sense for the jobs you've submitted. You can also change this to be a very specific list, like Jamie said, like I only want to have C3 8 extra large. Or you can do shorthand function in here and say, I like the C3 family and just use C3 and nothing else because any one of the C3 family will work. And if you're submitting a single job, you don't want to launch an eight extra large. But if you put 10,000 jobs in, we should definitely use the larger instances to, to, to solve that for you. And then kind of the, the obvious things, subnets, uh, security group IDs, key pairs, um, some tags. So you can pass tags through in the API. It's pretty important for people. So uh, not only can you provide your own tags, but we'll tag the resources with an AWS batch tag. Uh, so it's easy to do. And, uh, and then a service role. So we need a role that uh, we can operate in your account. So uh, you'll find this in the IAM console under the list of available roles. And so it's gone ahead and created that compute environment. So if I do a... Uh, a described compute environments call, I'll find that I've got two compute environments because uh, I believe in safety, so I launched one <laughs> earlier that if this one didn't work, we could use as well. So uh, what I've got here is two of them. One of them's called Demo1, and uh, it's already up and running. I, I launched that before we came over. A couple of things that are slightly different in here. This one, the desired CPUs is already set to 16, and like I said, I used the shorthand C3. So it means anything in the C3 family will work for me in this compute environment. And so I should be able to find that actually in our system. And then the one I just created, which is called Live Demo, just to remind me we're doing it live. And uh, in here, we've got optimal for the instance types and the tags that we wanted to pass through. So the next thing I need to do is create a job queue. Now, let me do this actually. So um, within a job queue, 
we have something called compute environment order. So when Jamie gave that demo, he, he noted that the top one was taking all the C4s and the R3s, and it was the one that was taking the high priority work. And then they added another compute environment called the spot compute environment. It had all the yellow jobs that were being fed into it. And what Jamie had done in that demo there is he'd taken the job queue and he'd specified the compute environment order and he'd specified the first compute environment with a uh, compute environment order of one and the second one with two. So the compute environment order is just an integer, um, lower integers first, higher integers later. And you can have uh, up to three compute environments right now all in one job queue and it will order its way through those. And it will only scale those up when the, the first compute environment can no longer scale or when the first compute environment is fully utilized by, by the system. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and create one with my copy paste here to make life simple. See, that's why we have copy paste. You don't watch me doing this all day. <laughs> and uh, I also made another one of these earlier as well, just in case nothing was working. So we have two job queues in here. We have demo one and I have live demo. And uh, you can see that they're pointing at uh, two different uh, computer environments. And I could update that and, and move them over. You also note that these have things like state and status. So state is something you control. State is a, a property that when you're, uh, you want to stop jobs going to a compute environment or you want to stop a job queue from accepting work or you want things to gracefully drain down, you can control that through the state of them. And the status is our feedback to you that you know, we were successful in creating resources or the config that you passed to us was valid and we were able to bring the system up. So uh, some job definitions Jamie mentioned are the templates for jobs. Now, they take a little bit longer to create, so I, of course, went ahead and did those first. Um, the first one, which is clearly my favorite, I've been doing HPC a little over a decade now. Uh, I've probably lost count of the number of sleep jobs I've run to make sure that the very expensive computer we just bought actually works. So uh, it's the same job we use when we're getting first started, is we like to fire a sleep job in and make sure that the very expensive system is capable of doing nothing for 60 seconds. <laughs> so um, the sleep job here, just to walk you through what it looks like, um, it's got an active status, so uh, job definitions are revisioned, similar to task definitions in ECS. What this enables you to do is actually to push new versions of job definitions out without impacting any workflow that you have. You may have created a genomics workflow like Jamie gave in the earlier examples, and it's pointing at versioned job definitions. Now that might be critical for compliance reasons. It might be critical because changing it might break something someone's doing and they have a deadline and it's important that you don't break their work. And so it's possible for you to reference with or without the revision the job definition when you're building your pipelines. And so if you use the, the revision number, you'll be able to always get that one. Um, you can make them inactive and no future jobs will use them, but it doesn't impact any running jobs or any jobs already submitted into the system. So. Um, We've got some stuff called parameters in here. So parameters are the notion of being able to define defaults within a job definition and then also being able to accept them when you submit jobs. So what I've done here is I've created a parameter called sleep time set to 120 seconds, so two minutes. And then down here in the command, which is being passed into the BusyBox container, which has sleep in it, I'm actually referencing that parameter with a ref. So I do ref colon colon sleep time and then when the job is submitted, I can either take it from the parameters provided here, or I can override it at submit time with a new parameter and change it without having to create a new job definition. What I can also do is not provide the parameters here, but still reference them, and it makes it a required parameter. So if someone tries to submit the job and they don't provide the sleep time, it's going to throw a client exception saying sleep time is required to submit the job. So you can actually build up quite complex job definitions where you have required parameters with defaults. Defaults are overridable. Required parameters must be provided and there's no default. So the, the sort of examples we do there is if you're doing like genomics, GATK, like you actually have to provide the BAM file and it's required for it to move forward. Whereas you may actually have some defaults about maybe the data set that you're querying for that job definition. You can leave them set as parameters. Um, some of the other stuff in here, um, things that are semi-interesting, memory and vCPUs. So um, when we were looking at building the batch system, uh, 
Docker is sort of one of the technologies that, that's behind this containerization. Uh, they think of CPUs in 1,024 units. And uh, we sat down and spoke to a lot of customers. And they were like, no, no, we, we think about CPUs, just the whole CPUs. Um, there's no floating point CPUs there. So uh, it's, it's somewhat interesting for you when you first get started. But everything is a vCPU based. And, and it actually makes a lot of sense because all of our EC2 instances are vCPU based. And so what you're specifying effectively is the amount of EC2 that you're looking for. The other thing that we've tried to do is really keep you focused around job level primitives. So what does the job require? And, and less about how I want my compute to be brought up and what specific one I'm looking for, but rather define the requirements and we'll go find the right one for you. Um, uh, Jamie hinted at it earlier, Lambda. So this one's a containerized uh, job function. And we'll go ahead and submit this. So. Now you're using a different job definition for that for the job you just submitted, right, Google? Oh, I did. Yeah, I put the stress one in. Sorry. Well, it's six and a half of them. Um, so what we can see here is I didn't quite walk it through, but it's exactly the same self-explanatory. This is a stress test job, so it spins up CPU and memory and actually makes something appear in consoles and logs, etc. Um, it's already jumped into its runnable state. And so um, just a quick walk through of the states that we support in the system right now. So we have submitted, pending, runnable, starting, running, succeeded, and failed. And I'll really quickly walk through what those mean and what's happening within the environment so you have a sort of bit of an understanding of how the system functions behind the scenes. So submitted is a state that you, you may see, depending on the volume of work you have in the system, you'll note that when I did describe jobs, it was already at runnable. So it already jumped forward to two states. What submitted means is that the front end's accepted your job and we've persisted it into a data store and that we're going to start looking at that job. That means your job is there. Okay, that, that's it done. So from a web service perspective, API is complete. We've got your job. Um, if it moves into pending, it means that there's dependencies for this job. And so when a job is sitting in pending, it means there's other things that are required for this job to be able to move into another state. If it's in runnable, it means that we've evaluated the job. There's absolutely no reason as far as the scheduler is concerned this job should not be running, so it's in a runnable state but it's likely that we don't have any capacity in the compute environment. And so at this point, we're probably telling the compute environment that it needs to go add some capacity, scale up, et cetera. Um, if it's in starting, it means we've given it off to ECS and said, hey, please go and run this job for us. And I, I think running succeeded and failed are somewhat self-explanatory, but uh, the running is when it's on the cluster. Succeeded means that we took, and it's a very classic, exit code zero. This is how Docker thinks about it. It's a very Unixy way. I quite like it myself. And failed is non-zero. So you can have anything there at all, and it will be failed. And you can build dependencies around these states as well. So let me just take a look, see if this is there. So he's still runnable. So assuming my console foo is working, Behind a managed compute environment, we leverage auto-scaling to go ahead and spin up an environment. Now, it hasn't gone and spun up an environment for the live demo one yet. And the reason for that is it takes a little bit of time to evaluate the job queue. It doesn't immediately start launching capacity. Now, how long it takes is something that we're honestly still waiting for more feedback from customers. We're going to dial that into the appropriate number. You want to be really careful um, if you over-index on the single job problem, then you end up building a system that launches one instance immediately. Um, and then someone comes along and starts submitting a job every two minutes, and you end up with thousands of small instances. And they're like, I really wanted maybe 10 big instances. That would have been a much more effective way of doing this. The algorithm that we use, or the, the approach that we take, is a least instances approach to, to capacity. We think of instances or all of the resources they use as having a cost. Now, while the cost of compute for a C3 large is the same as a C3 4 extra large, just a quarter of it, it takes four ENIs to launch four C4s. It takes four IPs. It starts 
burning through resources you may not have in your environment. You might not have unlimited IP addresses. And so we actually want to be sort of conservative about how we use those resources and, and what we do with them. So this guy should hopefully go wake up on auto scaling in the background. While we're doing, while he's waking up, let me grab one I created earlier and stick it in. So both of these guys have gone into submitted. Probably it'll take about 60 seconds for something to evaluate them and decide to move them forward. And when it does, we should see that the first job we submitted, which was the sleep job, it's going to go through and find a, a compute resource in the ECS cluster that's already there. And then the second job should move into a pending state, and it should be waiting for that first one to finish. So the first job is moved to runnable. The second job is moved to pending. So this job has a dependency. In fact, we can probably see the depends on here. The thing about the depends on, it's a list. So you can actually have multiple dependencies. You can build quite a wide graph on there or a wide DAG. Um, and you can specify that all of them need to, to be successful. And then the bottom job here is now moved to starting. So what that means is if I go in and actually take a look at ECS, we should actually find in here that we've got some ECS clusters. Uh, live demo is quietly coming up in the background, you'll notice as well. So if I go back here to my auto-scaling groups, and sorry if I'm jumping around, folks. You sh hopefully can stick with this. Um, it'll bring that up in a second. So this one, demo one, should now actually have a task running on it. So we've pushed that task all the way out, and it's now sitting on the ECS cluster. Now, I could go and bring up our console if I brought our console up today and, and sort of show you it from our side as well. But these are the, under, the underpinning services. And one of the things we did, and I think Jamie hinted at it when we, we started, was we saw a lot of customers building all of this and pulling them together. And we thought we could do it two ways. We could hide all of the sausage making, and all you would have is a batch job that disappeared off somewhere. But the pretty overwhelming feedback we got from customers was, I kind of still want to see it. I, I want to know that my instances can access all my resources. I might want to add my own storage. I have a whole bunch of things I might want to do. And so we've basically let you see how it operates. Like we put all the resources into your account for you to take a look at it. Um, so this job here, I think, sleeps for two minutes probably. And this guy will stay pending and move forward. If I go back without jumping around too much, we should in a moment end up with a He's still waiting to go forward. Okay. And then the last thing I want to pull up here is logs. So all of the batch jobs within AWS batch log to CloudWatch logs. So all of the standard out, standard error goes into a CloudWatch log stream. There's an AWS batch log group. And so it's very easy to go in and find those logs. It's very easy to also build tooling around those logs. You can even have alerts on there. So you can actually trigger things that will cause alarms to be generated when logs are, are generated as well. Um, if we take a look in here, this was the stress test one I ran earlier. So all of the logging output in here was it running for 60 seconds on a stress job. Um, the job ID, or the, the name of the stream, is the job name, the job ID, and then the container ID. Um, if we do a retry on the job, we'll actually be able to put all of the logs in the same log stream with different uh, details on them. Let's see if it's brought up the other one. Not yet. Okay. So that's us putting jobs into the system, and uh, probably at this point, two minutes has passed. So this guy's succeeded. And this guy is now runnable, so it moved from pending to runnable. The system's comfortable that it can move the job forward, and hopefully within a sort of about 60 seconds, that'll move into starting and running, and it'll start to run that job out in the cluster as well. 
So that was a, a little bit of a live demo. Fortunately, everything works right now uh, of AWS Patch. And uh, very happy to take any questions uh, that you guys have today. Thank you.